It's more than basis day today, Friday the 30th of October. I'm lucky for some, but not us. Um, we're going to carry on beating clocks as best we can. Um, so thanks for attending the Let's Talk Clocks conference. My name's Emma G, and I'm delighted to chair this session today on behalf of the DTE Specialist Network. Thank you so much to Joe Jerome and the whole Thrombosis UK team for organising such an amazing conference and for inviting us to have this session today. The DTE Specialist Network is a rapidly growing and hugely vibrant network of nurses, pharmacists and other allied healthcare professionals who work in thrombosis and anticoagulation. We do have an exhibit um, on the Thrombosis UK platform, so please have a look to learn some more about our network. Feel free to make contact and, and maybe you'd even want to join our network. We're over 100 strong now um, and have got so much expertise and knowledge within the network. So throughout this session today, we're going to be happy to take questions. Please use the Q&A button and we're going to, um, it's going to be quite a, a quick fire session today. So we're going to take all the questions at the end. Um, the meeting has got three sections and it's been inspired by the types of queries that our members frequently put to the network. And uh, we find those so rich and, and hugely beneficial that we thought it would be great to share that today in this session. So um, first of all, I am joined by Zoe, who is a ward manager and BTE lead from Spire Alexander, Lax, a deputy quality and safety lead from Portsmouth Hospitals, and Andrea, lead advanced nurse practitioner in thrombosis from the Princess of Wales Hospital. And they are going to talk about root cause analysis of hospital associated thrombosis. I'm going to share my screen and we'll get going with Zoe. Hello, so my name's Zoe and as Emma said, I work at Spire Alexandra and we're an elective surgical hospital and I'm also the VTE lead there. And I'm just going to talk briefly about root cause analysis with regards to thromboembolisms and the processes that we go through. Uh, next slide. Okay. So the first stage is obviously the reporting of a clot. So all of our patients, if they develop a blood clot well, during their inpatient stay or afterwards, they are to report it to us. And then we start the process of, we do duty of candor and then an instant report is raised, which gets submitted for root cause analysis for any patient who develops a clot after their operation within 90 days. So that's just a brief outline of how it gets to the point of root cause analysis. Then the actual RCA normally goes to myself, but it can be done by anybody. And the goal of the root cause analysis process is to identify if there was a cause of the problem in order to identify any potential solutions in the future. So to prevent this happening again, as much as we can. So you're looking at how and why did this event occur? And was there anything that we could have done to prevent this? So are you, we use a set format that goes through the presentation of the clot, the situation surrounding it, i.e. how it was developed, how long after the operation, what uh, things like that, the, their comorbidities as well, so their risk factors for the blood clot, whether or not they were risk assessed appropriately, whether or not they received the correct prophylaxis, chemical or mechanical during their stay, what advice they were given, were they told about mobility, like uh, mo mobilising quickly, uh, drinking enough to reduce their own risk, then what communication has gone on with the patient, whether they've had any concerns themselves that we would need to look into about their stay and the aftercare. This is then also reported externally, it goes to the CQC, and then you come up with an action plan. So identify any findings that you've made during your analysis of the situation uh, and then make an action plan of what you can do in future to prevent, to share this. Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. What you can do in future to prevent this happening and what you can do now to start that process going. Like, are there any immediate things that you're thinking of? 
that should have been done but were not or were done incorrectly. And that's your action plan. And then that's allocated to the relevant member of staff. Oh, and, and then this is communicated internally within the hospital. It's They have a few processes. So it's just all of our incidents are discussed every day. Then this also gets passed on to every hospital inspire. And because it goes to the external organizations as well, any learning is shared because the primary goal of root cause analysis is to look at how you can improve for the future and how you can then share that learning. So yeah, that's about it. I think it's over to Lakshmi. Thanks, Dave. You there, Lax? Sorry, I am. I'm just trying to share my end screen for the new slide decks. Uh, I've updated this slide deck. Oh, you have? Okay, one. cool. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Laksh. I work, as Emma said, as a uh, Deputy Quality and Safety Lead in Portsmouth. And I'm here to just briefly talk to you about PSEF. Um, and like Zoe's obviously described about the root cause analysis. Um, so the root cause analysis uh, it sits in the old serious incidents framework. And the National Patient Safety uh, Team have um, implemented a new framework called the patient safety incident response framework which replaces the serious incident framework and um, encourages us to move away from root cause analysis but more towards doing systems learning uh, so the re the reason is we haven't uh, we've done root cause analysis after root cause analysis nationally not just locally and we generate action plans which are meaningful at that moment in time but what ends up transpiring is that we don't end up making large scale change to change the system as a whole. And we've just generated an industry, especially in a large acute trust, um, uh, such as my own, where it's like over a thousand, a hundred beds. Uh, you generate an industry behind root cause analysis, but you don't actually give staff the headspace to uh, make the changes and make the difference. Um, next slide, please. So, in a nutshell, uh, PSERF replaces the serious incident framework. Uh, from a statutory regulation perspective, it doesn't change the duty of candor process in terms of informing uh, patients. So the way that we would go about it is, is that it doesn't change the communication with the patient, but it changes the conversation with the patient. Uh, and you may get to a state where you say, um, we had and you you acquired a hospital acquired thrombosis um these were the immediate actions we took in place to keep you safe but here's a large-scale trust-wide program that we're doing from known themes from the last how many ever incidences and we're making quality improvement so there might not necessarily be an individual investigation for each particular incident that happens depending on the volume of the incidents that, that happens uh but and as an organization, it allows you to have a bit more flexibility on the things that you focus in terms of quality improvement and the areas that you want to work. And it also gives you, you no know, set time scales uh, so that you can actually uh, make it work within your own uh, organization. But like most things in the NHS, uh, culture and collaboration is a key in aspect of this. And obviously creating a just and a safety culture where you're asking questions as why as opposed to who is what makes the difference really. Um, and in terms of how it's going to look like, it's going to use a systems-based approach. And for the, those of you that are interested, there's a, a system framework called SEEPS uh, 3.0, which is uh, what this is based on. Um, so if you do have some time, uh, by all means, have a read about it. And there's four main learning responses in PSERF that you can use to address any incident. Uh, and uh, again, it's within your own organization to identify which learning response tool you're going to use uh, to review VTE incidences. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a brief overview of the four different learning response tools within PSEF. Uh, the one that we think is going to be most likely to be used are swarms and after action reviews, uh, certainly in the, in the context of a hospital acquired thrombosis. So the swarms will allow you to, uh, in the moment, identify safety actions to keep the patient safe. And an after action review or a thematic review might allow you to review it in, in, in blocks and review certain incidents and find the general common theme in their way that you can address. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I, I'm a next slide again. 
oh, it might not be an update. It might this might not be the updated slide deck. Um, so from a uh, from a VT management perspective, um, so from our hospital certainly anyway, we've gone down a swarm route and we've created a template and we we put together a systems uh, engineering framework appendixes to answer some of the questions. And the way that we perceive it is that you would do swarms in the immediacy of finding the hospital quads from versus either an inpatient area or an, in an outpatient flow uh, um, area. And then you put immediate safety actions in place to keep the patient safe. And then uh, every six months or three months, the swarm paperwork will be taken through the thrombosis committee to identify any cross-cutting themes across the different areas and how we can feed it into our own existing quality improvement management system within our organization and how we can embed that change large scale as opposed to just focusing on just one incident at a time. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, moving on to Andrea, please. Hello. Um... So, uh, things slightly different, uh, well, not different in Wales. Um, we have um, root cause analysis reporting guidance. Uh, on the left hand side, there, this was the guidance that was uh, sent out to all of the seven health boards and Valindra Cancer Centre in 2016. And it's pretty much the same um, method as what's happening in England. So, I won't go through that with you. Um, but we have a template which is on the right. If you go to the next slide, please, uh, Emma. So this is our HAT reporting template and every health board in Wales will complete this quarterly. We collect the potentially preventable HATS uh, figures which we get from radiology and our uh, patient admission system. Um, and then we add them to this chart or this template submit this every three months to Welsh Government and then from Welsh Government um, we also uh, once we've identified any hats so as you can see we've got the total number of patients who we suspect may be hospital acquired thrombosis we then remove um, any notes that can't be found so they go in that section if they are found at a later date they are added at a later date we then have the number of patients who have the root cause analysis and then from those, those patients that are deemed to be hospital acquired, and at the bottom, the number of patients that um, are, are then excluded. Um, so what we do then is any patients who are identified as being hospital acquired thrombosis, um, we follow the duty of candor and they are reported as appropriate. Any hats then are reported on Datex, the same as Zoe explained. Uh, they're reported to clinical governance, reported back on this template to Welsh Government and then discussed locally in uh, the Thrombosis Committee. Uh, next slide please. Then Welsh Government, um, we get results from them. This particular result is from a hospital thermometer. Um, in Wales in 2016 we agreed to use a risk assessment uh, tool on our medication charts and the figures from this are picked up or were picked up until earlier this year on a hospital thermometer by pharmacists. Um, so we were able to see what our uptake of thromboprophylaxis risk assessment on all patients admitted was. That has now come to an end. So our thrombosis, uh, our thrombosis steering group are now looking at how we're going to start collecting this data we're currently awaiting um, electronic prescribing to come in across all of the seven health boards. So we've got a bit of a gap. So we need to fill that gap. So we'll be looking at that. Um, next slide, please, Emma. And this is our Wales Hat Performance um, table, which is produced or used to be produced by Welsh Government for us. Um, so as you can see on this, this table, we, which is showing from 2019 through to 2021, um, the, the table on the top right hand side demonstrates the drop in hats that we'd experienced. There has been a, a peak there, which was during COVID, which wasn't unexpected. Um, the green and red arrows on the left hand side showing the downturn in the number of uh, patients who presented with potential hat and those which were. Um, identified as hats 
and I'm pleased to see that that figure was dropping. Um, the number, uh, the, the larger graph across the, the bottom is the number that actually presented um, to determine whether or not they were had. So they were prior to having the root cause analysis. Um, where the Welsh government now have, have dropped us, uh, unfortunately, we're no longer on their performance table. So we've now took up with Welsh Risk Pool and we're working with them at the moment to develop a way of now transferring the data to them instead of Welsh government. Um, and we'll carry on working in the same way, reporting it to clinical governance and to Welsh Risk Pool so that we can continue to um, demonstrate our performance and um, at the touch of a button, we can all see how we're all doing collectively. And then when we meet up as an all well steering group, we present back our own data and look at how we can improve um, situations and, and implement action plans so that if there are any areas of concern, we can address them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. That was a whistle stop tour there. And um, please keep your questions coming in. There's lots to talk about with regards to PCER and um, the processes that we're undertaking. Nice to hear a cross section there. And um, very jealous of your all Wales data set that you've got there, Andrea. Shame it's coming to an end, but it's really lovely to be able to see that. Um, we are moving swiftly on now. So our next focus is on lower limb immobilization. And I'm pleased to welcome Bex, who is an anticoagulation pharmacist from Sheffield Hospital. Sue, a quality improvement nurse in North Bristol, and Hugh, thrombosis nurse consultant from Derryford in Plymouth. So over to you, Bex. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us um, today. Um, so Sue, Hugh and I are going to talk about lower limb um, immobilisation and thrombosis risk assessment and how our trusts have different approaches. This is a screenshot which essentially describes our BTE risk assessment um, tool for patients with uh, lower limb cast. So I'm, um, I've am i been in post um, about 10 years and we've been using Rivaroxaban for thromboprophylaxis in patients with lower limb immobilization since 2011. We've had lots of queries and we're always very happy to share our experiences and, um, and the processes that we um, have gone through in order to satisfy the various requirements of medicine safety groups and um, therapeutics committees and, and stuff. And yeah, so happy to sort of share what we've done, um, especially I think because we were early adopters. We haven't got a huge amount of, of data about outcomes, but I'll come back to that um, in a few minutes. Um, so our current pathway is that patients are referred by the ED to Fracture Clinic and Fracture Clinic conduct the VT risk assessment. When we looked at lag time between ED attendance and Fracture Clinic, we were reasonably satisfied that that was um, an appropriate timescale. I think things are changing and I think we're going to try and persuade the ED physicians to undertake the risk assessment but um, certainly as things stand um, that's that's the way things go. Um, so we developed a risk assessment tool um, which to which we added um, Achilles tendon rupture following a very sad um, local case where a young man died of a PE um, following um, an Achilles tendon rupture so uh, but uh, interesting to see that um, um, one of the papers that I was looking at um, in preparation for this talk, the, the consensus was that Achilles tendon rupture was a, um, a potentially uh, um, um, was a pro potential predictor um, for VTE. And it's actually been interesting looking at, at the Plymouth tool. I'm not going to steal Hughes Thunder, but theirs is validated and ours isn't, um, and where the gaps are and, and where the surprises are really in the omissions um, in both in both forms. So we also have travel again, a bit of a contentious one, but um, and but that we know is immobility associated with anything really. Um, the travel it doesn't have to be plain travel, but can in, increase um, the risk of thrombosis. 
In terms of supply, we, we make all the supply from the hospital. So there's no shared care with the um, primary care clinicians in Sheffield. We give a six week or until next review supply. Um, and we've got a patient information leaflet, which outlines general thrombosis prevention um, measures that patients can take, as well as an explanation about off-label use of rivaroxaban. So quick audit snapshot, the first two years of the pathway. 527 patients, obesity and previous VTE were the most common VTE from risk factors. Prescribing was lower than expected. I think there was a bit of an education issue reminding orthopedic surgeons that aspirin is not thromboprophylaxis, although contentious because now it is again. Um, so, so the audit was, um, was quite interesting in, in that there were patients who um, the audit identified were at risk but didn't receive thromboprophylaxis for various reasons um, and over two years and those 530 patients there was one VTE in the prophylaxis group and there were four in the no prophylaxis group one of whom had two thrombosis risk factors so you were not talking about huge numbers um, potentially we could have had um, one fewer in that no prophylaxis group if they'd been offered prophylaxis but you never really know do you so yeah there you go just a little snapshot of how we run things here in Sheffield um happy to take questions via the chat thank you very much Bex on to Sue now please can you hear me we can I found a short method just press the space bar if you've lost your mouse and you can't put it on the thing. Uh, right. Um, hi, everybody, and thank you for dialing in. And this is a very contentious issue with our orthopedic colleagues because the evidence out there for actually risk assessing and doing anything about it is like 50 50. Um, so I'm um, I was previously the lead BTE and anticoagulation nurse. And as um, Emma said, I'm now a, a quality governance nurse working at North Bristol Trust. We did instigate um, a VT risk assessment for lower limb um, prior to COVID using um, Hugh's um, strict risk assessment that you'll be able to see in a minute. And that was kind of going okay. It was like in little steps we were getting there. And then COVID came along and everybody got busy doing something else. And like all new things you implement, you kind of need people pushing it. So it kind of felt by the wayside. So we're now resurrecting it, and it's quite important because we just had two instances of somebody getting a large proximal DVT post a, um, a cast fitted to their leg, plus somebody ended up with a saddle embolus, and that made me think I need to send this up to the highest level. We do need people to be risk assessing because the Emergency College of um, Physicians suggests they risk assess, but our problem here is um, what to do with that risk assessment afterwards when they go to fracture clinic, because you do need buy-in from your orthopedic colleagues. So that's our big problem. Um, I know that there was a, there is a, a new trial starting or it closed to it. Um, Emma, tell me if I got this wrong. Called the Tilly trial because you know you need to give orthopedic um, surgeons evidence as to why they need to do something. So there was a Tilly trial going on now, which is actually going to we hope bottom this out. But prior to the Tilly trial, there was a Tilly study done by the University of Sheffield looking at all the papers that have been written about a low limb immobilization and risk of clots. And they came out with a, a 1% to 2% risk of a clot. Um, clearly, some are more at risk than others. And both these patients that came up on my hospital acquired thrombosis list, although they're not at HATS, I'm making a separate database for them, um, were both overweight. Um, so that's where we are and I am going to make this short and finish now and I hope we can use the Tilly trial and at a later date I'll let you know how I've got on with persuading the orthopaedic surgeons to get on but we're going to be using Hugh's risk assessment tool. Thank you. Thank you Sue, well done. Um, over to Hugh now please. Thank you Sue. Yeah, we were quite uh, adopters of this back in 2004, so we're 19 years into risk assessing our POP patients, and interestingly, it all came about because of the nurse-led DVT clinic, who picked up that all these patients were going there, legs in plaster, getting new DVTs, and of course, historically, they were completely, there was no connection between them and the fraction clinic for orthopaedics. 
but I mean, John Keenan, one of our, is an orthopedic surgeon, took this on board, thought this, this doesn't seem right. So this was our version one we first brought out, which is the first thing we used, started using 40 milligrams of clexane as our prophylaxis um, and saw about 10%. About so pretty small numbers initially of patients were needing um, chemical prophylaxis. And um, interestingly, we had initially, it was in ED, the form was completed, but actually then again, when they went to fracture clinic, it was filled in a second time, because it's possible there were bits of this first time, particularly around family history. People don't always know. When they get home, and then they speak to their parents, or they're like, oh yeah, such and such had that. So we found there often were differences, and perhaps occasionally <laughs> would go from not needing prophylaxis to needing it. So that was the first thing. So all going very well until 2010, where NICE brought out CG92. So if you go to the next slide, please. And as we know, CG92, which was basically made some changes, this is when we adopted the risk assessment for all and made some changes to our form, changed the family history. That's a contentful. Nobody's really sure why that happened. We would say it was Mr. Keenan and Dr. Tim Noakes who were kind of involved in this. And it's not really clear. They both say they're the person's responsibility, but not hugely clear why that happened. BMI was increased and unable to weight bear was increased. And this meant is about 30% of people after this was changed now required prophylaxis. It's a bit of an increase, but again, we were still seeing pretty small numbers of prophylaxis. Uh, a friend of a VT event, sorry. But it was sort of looking at, um, is this okay? So it came to 2014, if you go to the next slide, where the version three, which is the current one we're still using, where again, the family history was brought back down to two. We didn't really feel that alone needed it. As you can see, there are certain conditions that will require, basically if you score three, you need prophylaxis. We still pretty much only use clexane and noxaparin for these patients. Very occasionally, very needle phobic patients will use low dose of roxaban. I have kind of brought this up a few times, but there's not, there's no great appetite to do so, despite the fact that we know Clexane is getting more expensive and it's probably not open people want to inject themselves, but we still pretty much will use Clexane for all. Um, and what this shows you, there are, and again, it's still, it's still around the same number of people. There's about 30% of patients that we see will require prophylaxis. We validated it. So out of 825 patients that went through this, we saw three VT events or 0.36%, which is, seems a pretty low, which is obviously there'll be some patients we couldn't follow up out of area. Being in Plymouth, we have a bit of a military population we can't follow up, but we were kind of happy that this was probably shown to be safe. Um, we reckon it's about five, five to six weeks is the average length of time people are in a, a risk, a, a cast for. And, and so you can see a lot of injections they're doing. And obviously one of the issues that you always run into if you're asking people to inject themselves, um, are they compliant with the whole process? And you, bait, you have to take on board what they're telling you. So, and in theory, those cases they had, they did take it. But of course, we don't always know, which is one of the reasons. So we, um, we are still looking. And actually, this trial may give us the evidence that actually low-dose um, DOAC is probably safe. So you go on to the last slide. So we've validated our score. We've, we've published it there. There's the kind of reference showing that actually this, this seems to be safe. It certainly shows a significant reduction in VTE. In, in our population, we, we do see a lot less a lot, lot less VT events. And I say it's all really goes back to a massive amount for nursing. It all goes back to the nurse-led VTE clinic. And actually Zara Lester, who kind of brought up, this doesn't seem right. And having a really good orthopedic surgeon on board is so important. We were very lucky that he was so keen to get involved in it and it's made a massive difference. So um, within my five minutes, that's probably all I've talked about. I'm happy to get on some questions later. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Everyone's doing really well so far at keeping to time. I'm so impressed. It's not easy. Once we get started, it's not easy to stop us, is it? <laughs> but thank you. And so moving on now, our final discussion welcomes Rose, BTCNS from Royal Cornwall Hospital, Carolyn, who's National Clinical Specialist for Blood Transfusion and BT Prevention from Spire Hospitals, and my colleague here with me, Lorena, BT Clinical Nurse Specialist from King's College Hospital. And they're going to talk about um, how they implement VT education and training. So first of all, to Carolyn. Uh, that's not my number. It's me. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Rose Gibson. 
Um, I am the VT Prevention Practitioner for Royal Cornwall Hospital Trust down in the southwest. Um, next slide, please. It's a brief overview of the size of RCHC. We have three hospitals. Um, that is obviously the population of Cornwall, not of inpatient beds. Um, my role is new. Um, as of April 2023, previously VTE prevention was sort of added into the thrombosis nurse uh, workforce but they are very busy so they've created a standalone sort of quality improvement patient safety role which is mine um there's four thrombosis nurses and there's now two consultants who are associated with vte prevention and thrombosis next slide please um so we or i i do all the education for vt prevention do a cpd study day once a month journey to improvement as you can see uh, on the left hand side it's uh, not just VT, it's all avoidable harms that we target and some bits and pieces around mental capacity. Um, it's mostly nurses and nursing associates and some healthcare assistants, healthcare assistants that attend those. Those photos on the right is just some humble bragging of feedback I got for my training, um, but it's very well received. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of junior doctor training, I have a 15 minute slot in the F1 induction, which happens a couple of times a year. It's it's not really long enough. I'll try and get them to beef that up in in future. They also have a weekly training session for the F1s and F2s. I'm trying to get myself included in those once every three to four months, um, normally discussing risk assessment and sort of specific incidents around hospital associated thrombosis. I also uh, do ad hoc training on the wards if there's been a preventable hat. Um, I, I invite myself to absolutely everything, any governance meetings, any care groups, any grand rounds, anything I can get myself invited to to do some training, I do. Next slide, please. Um, again, the actual content of my training sessions really depends on who um, who I'm talking to, but I'll do an overview of risk assessment, um, a discussion around thromboprophylaxis. If it's a, a cohort of nurses or nursing associates and we talk about decline doses and patient capacity and sort of documentation in particular around decline doses, always um, I, I like interactive sessions. I don't, I don't, um, ironically don't tend to use a PowerPoint. I like a, I like a whiteboard and a pen and to get interaction and feedback uh, as, as the session goes on. Next slide, please. So looking forward, this is what I'd like to do for next year. I've only been in the post for six months. So I want to get my feet under the table before I start demanding, um, you know, e-modules for VTE, but that's what I'd like to do at the Trust. That's me, done. Well done. Um, on now to Carolyn. Hi, I'm Carolyn. I'm clinical um, blood transfusion lead and VT prevention for Spire. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick overview of Spire Healthcare. We have 39 hospitals nationwide um, and approximately 60% of those patients are private and 40% are NHS. We predominantly are an elective surgery um, organization for adult surgery, but we also have CYP services for outpatients and elective surgery. There's 18 hospitals that provide an oncology service and four of our hospitals actually have ITU um, facilities. So we do have quite complex surgeries as well. And approximately about 50% of our patients are joint surgery patients. Next slide, please. So um, VT prevention is one of the um, quality improvement program initiatives for 2023. Um, and as part of that, we've set some uh, SPIRE targets to support VT prevention. And this is ongoing support, education, training to achieve these targets is predominantly provided by me. And then it's disseminated out to the VT leads in each hospital and links. So our four targets are around fluid hydration. We have SIP to send throughout our hospitals, but we also want our patients to come in and make sure that they're fluid hydrated uh, to up to 200 mils um, prior to um, 
three hours prior to surgery, but we also are encouraging now unlimited amounts of fluid uh, prior to uh, going to theatre. We have a really robust early uh, mobilisation programme um, with day zero mobilisation. Our target is eight hours post-operatively from a GA, and then we're looking at trying to reduce that to six hours. And we're working hard towards a 23-hour discharge pathway for our joint surgery. So we know we're really focusing on our early mobilisation. Our VT risk assessment is still paper driven, um, but our target compliance is 95% uh, for correct assessment. And this is completed at pre-op assessment and then reassessed on ward admission. And then if there's any deteriorating situations or clinical changes to the predicted surgical pathway. Uh, pharmacological prophylaxis target is 95%, as so you can probably appreciate with all those different hospitals, with many, many different consultants feeding in from different trusts, we have an array of um, low molecular weight heparins, DOACs, and also um, antiplatelets. Next slide, please. So um, as mentioned, I'm, I oversee all the hospitals from a VT prevention perspective. In each hospital, we have a VT lead. We then also have VT links and they're in ward theatre, pharm pharmacy, pre-op, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really so we have a, a MDT um, collaboration effect in all of our hospitals. Um, they're required to have a quarterly um, uh, hospital VT committee meetings, which we've actually found really powerful um, to make change and educate and um, that sort of thing within the hosp each hospital situation. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what's the training package look like for SPIRE? Well, it, it is um, in a process of being changed and that's because I've only been in post since uh, January. So we're updating a lot of aspects of it. So it is one of our core competencies. We expect every clinical staff member to um, have received training for VT prevention. So we have a learning resource to support that. Um, and that's also uh, going to have a quiz incorporated. So we know that everybody's completed it. Uh, this is actually being updated at the moment. So we're going to have a general section for uh, all clinicians and that will be around VT prevention. So that basis and then there'll be specific VT learning resource for each department so it's targeted training more bespoke to their roles so for instance if it's pre-op assessment we'll concentrate on the VT risk assessment the management of the patient and anticoagulation and bridging um, so that's sort of how it will be designed um, the VT competencies will align with those learning resources so we're going to have individual um, competencies so pharmacy will have a pharmacy um, VT competency etc we've also just implemented a suspicion of a P in DVT pathway that's based on NICE and also um, um, the well score. So if we suspect that the patients had a VTE, then that um, pathway is initiated and it's only just become live and it's working really well with recognition of patients' um, early diagnosis. The other aspects we're implementing is um, extreme body weight guidance and treatment dose guidance and travel um, guidance for um, pre-op and post-op patients. Next slide, please. Um, so finally, um, our program that we're implementing across Spire is a driving clinical excellence program, and uh, that really is to in be incorporated to all um, our um, identified staff. And it also supports our apprenticeship programs that we have in Spire. So as our um, apprenticeship students um, become qualified, we're supporting them with that driving clinical excellence. Um, the only as other aspect I just wanted to mention was the VT risk assessment. We're really trying to um, hone into our staff that actually it's about the management of the patient, the VT risk assessment for the whole patient journey, and that they really need to look at their comorbidities, etc. So it's an individualized VT risk assessment. Thanks, Emma. Well done. Thank you. And last but definitely not least, over to you, Louisa. Thanks, Emma. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I only have one slide for all of you. Mm -hmm. um, so for education and training at King's College Hospital, 
all um, patients facing um, clinical professionals have to complete the VTE e-learning module, which talks about VTE itself or the types of VTE and um, the prophylaxis, different types of prophylaxis, and they have to complete a quiz for them to be able to get the certificates. Um, for doctors, um, FY1s or any consultants or new doctors joining the trust, we have a monthly induction and I have a five minute slot about VTE risk assessment and prophylaxis each month. And they also invite me um, ad hoc um, for like specialty trainings, um, usually once every few months. For nurses, um, pre-COVID, -pre uh, we used to have a face-to-face -face induction, but unfortunately they're now doing like a different types of training. So they complete VTE e-learning but I'm invited by their PDNs if needed by um, from each ward, um, focusing on the low molecular weight heparin dosing because we are um, based or using weight based dosing for prophylaxis. And if there are significant issues based on each ward, we um, address them during the training as well. And for HAs, they have um, two weekly induction, so I do have an hour session with them, focusing on how to apply mechanical prophylaxis correctly. And I do um, an interactive session with them with quiz. And um, this usually is very an entertaining session for them. And we also um, orientate them to the animation video created by, by the trust and uh, the thrombosis center at King's so that they're able to um, impart this with their interaction um, with our patients. And we do have VTE link nurses on um, some wards. So we do talk about um, issues and their um, competency documents so that they're able to do ad hoc trainings with their colleagues from each ward. We also have um, now it's biannually circulated a VTE and anticoagulation newsletter. So any updates on guidelines, any issues or learnings from hospital associated thrombosis or any changes at all, we circulate that. And I think we have, I think it's every year that we have the VT and anticoagulation study day that is um, addressing any um, health professional in the trust just to have a more extensive um, education and training about VT and anticoagulation. And that is it. That's the main gist of how we do education and training here at King's College Hospital. Thank you for your attention. Now over to you, Emma. Thank you, Marina. Um, so yeah, I think um, that one of our challenges around education and training is ensuring that we, um, ensuring that people retain the information. So, you know, you heard that we get five minutes with doctors. And um, so Rose, you probably feel a bit better about getting 15 minutes now with doctors, but um, in that short, short period of time, when they're being bombarded with information about lots of other really important things, and we know that there are competing uh, safety issues, um, how do we ensure that we get the information across in a way that's going to be um, understandable, that they're going to retain it, and actually that's going to result in behavioural change when they're actually undertaking their work? Um, I'm, I'm not saying I have the answers to that, but I think that's what we really need to be thinking about and getting feedback from our training to make sure that we optimise it and use our precious time with people as well as possible. Um, for a while, there was a really nice initiative at King's whereby they did some joined up holistic training, whereby um, it would be a case based scenario and the harm, the different harm leads would come together. And, you know, the poor patient would end up with a fall, a UTI, a VTE, everything, basically. But it was just a way of, um, of joining up that thinking so that people weren't needing to think about the different harms or the different um, patient safety issues sort of in silos. Um, so thank you everyone um what an amazing panel and i know that that was a really rapid whistle stop tour of um three topics that we could have spent an hour on each easily and um, my colleagues on the panel um have been hugely busy answering all of your questions so thanks guys for that um just a couple of them um, of ones though, that i'd like to for us to discuss if we go back to um, our panel talking about root cause analysis, um, I think that a lot of the questions that we get um, at the VSN are around implementation of PSERF. And Lax, um, you did a lovely job of explaining to us what PSERF is, what it means. Um, are you able to offer any practical advice, though, for people wanting to implement PSERF in their 
uh, in their organisations and not really knowing where to start and, and what that might mean they do differently for root cause analysis of how. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hopefully you can still hear me because I'm on two devices, so I'm <laughs> hopefully unmuted in the, wrong, in the correct device. Um, so I suspect the real crux of it is, is that You've obviously all work in systems that have governance processes and systems already in place that are reviewing this either as part of patient safety teams or as part of thrombosis committee or whatever it might look like. And I suppose it's, it's really, really having those conversations with the key stakeholders to say, actually, what is it that we want to move to? Because historically, and certainly from my experience of RCDAs, we end up uh, um, getting the response a bit far too late, sometimes three months, four months down the line when we're so far away from the incident cases that any learning is either diluted or we've lost the actual, the truth behind the actual circumstances that led to that potential omission or whatever it might be. And a prime example is, this, like I said, at the moment we're trying a, a, a swarm template that I've shared with some of the colleagues in the VS10 and it's, it's an iterative process. I've, I've, I've adapted it many times over, even since I've sent it over. But I used to on a, a maternity case recently and it picked up so much more than what an RCA would have done that would have been done four months later. It, it identified, for example, uh, why the patient uh, left without taking the TTS in the first place because of potentially some safeguarding issues from a, 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 a partner um, that that was aggressive towards the staff, for example. That would never have been picked up in an RCA had we not done that conversation then and there with the ward staff at that moment in time. So I do think it allows you to find more systems issue than our original historical last years would be. Uh, one size won't fit all, and that's why there are four learning response tools. Uh, and it's ultimately about with the data that you collect in these tools. What are you then doing with that said data? Because historically, again, we used to collect data just for the sake of collecting it. Um, although there is a, an interest presently for subject matter experts here around specific conditions, specific past medical histories, and the correlation, et cetera, et cetera, which you can uh, you know, capture in a full RCA template. The piece of template kind of moves away from that to get the immediate actions and the immediate learning that is separate from that individual patient, but also about the things that lead staff to not work in the best way that they intend to work because of the systems and environment they put in, uh, which ultimately will, is what's going to change the practice, really. So I would say don't be um, worried to try different templates and don't be worried about the whole PDSA cycle because ultimately I think PISA kind of leads us to that, really, is that you won't uh, it won't work for just you know the, the best iteration of whatever template you use. Uh, templates aside, it's about what do you want to lead into. And I think the last thing is that most trust, I imagine, will have a QI methodology and a QI team. So it's about how do you then take what you find in these different uh, um, you know, incidents reviews into into that QI team? Because, you know, for example, in mine, if I said um, you know weight-based calculations and dosing is is, is an issue in in, in in some of the root causes or the investigations I've seen. And uh, that's not the case. That's, it's not specific to BTE. That's specific to other other drugs and other medication. And this is about how do I link what I have learned through to other quality improvement projects to say actually say to the trust, this is a large scale problem that if you were to fix EPMA or if you were to educate, if you were to focus a particular project on this one thing, it will have like a, a secondary effect on some of the things that we see as well. So it's about uh, how do we feed that into that as well. So that kind of is, that's like you said, you probably could talk for hours on end just to just on this cell end, really. Yeah, thank you, Lax. And then I think, like I said to you before, in my simple mind, I uh, think of it as working smarter, not harder, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just staying with you and then um, going to Zoe, uh, a really common question and one that we've had in the chat is well, what about when you don't have a dedicated BTU practitioner in your hospital? And I know this is particularly relevant to you, Lax, and also to Zoe, who is a ward manager, which is a hugely busy job in itself, but also the VT lead. Um, so how do you make that work? And what, just very briefly, Lax, how has it worked in Portsmouth? And then we'll come to Zoe. So in us, because we have divisions and governance structures, the the ownership of the review is 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 put at at, at the ward level, um, and especially again with PISA, because it's about the immediacy of having it done, either it be in the outpatient setting or at the ward level. 
the expectation is that that will be fed through their governance structure. But then because there's a, a, a local risk management system like Datex that reports into, then I get cited onto it and I just liaise with whichever governance team I need to liaise with. But ultimately, because I sit with part of the patient safety team as well, it comes to me to sign off as well. So then I get oversight across the whole piece. So although we don't have one particular person, um, we we have that patient safety team oversight alongside with the divisional governance process. But in an ideal world, and I would, you know, I did have a VT practitioner who would do the education, who would go in and 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 do uh, do the things that uh, the other colleagues were describing earlier around education. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's it's a resource issue more than anything else. Yeah, thank you. I think. But without a dedicated VTE practitioner, I think um, we need to be a bit creative and, and figure out uh, where VT prevention can sit and whose responsibility it is. And even if you can just get um, you know, somebody whose role it is just part time to do that, um, I think it just ensures that accountability and, and maintains that momentum. Um, yeah. Zoe, are you there just to tell us yeah. about how you manage VT prevention alongside your, I'm sure, very busy role as a ward manager? So I am a ward sister, but fortunately we don't get that many clots. So it's not often that I have to do a root cause analysis. I can appreciate that in a in a much larger hospital where you've got medical patients and uh, acu acutely critically ill patients, it would be a much bigger role and therefore you would need a dedicated person. But generally I, I just, it, it goes to governance because it's raised on Datex and they don't have to allocate it to the VTE lead. It can, a root cause analysis can be done by any member of staff competent to undergo that process because a lot of it is re reviewing what has happened and you get that information from the notes and speaking to staff. So it doesn't have to be a VTE lead. But like you said about being creative, someone has to... Be responsible so i think if you've got no vte committee or lead supporting you then it would be a governance related choice of who's best to undertake the root cause analysis yeah great thank you um just moving on to the lower limb mobilization panel um i know that you've been busy answering questions and some of the questions again that we get through the network and some that you've answered today are around the agent of choice so, um, Sue, you said that you, you're using Loma for heparin, but I think, um, Bex, you use rivaroxaban. Um, and can you just tell us how that works in practice? I know there have been some questions about um, who checks the bloods and, and how old, you know, can you accept the bloods being uh, and safely go on to describe? Yes. So, um, well, my understanding of how it works is the bloods are taken in fracture clinic. Um, and so the whole process it is operated at a fracture clinic, risk assessment, bloods, review bloods, give a prescription for rivaroxaban. Um, how old is too old? It's difficult, isn't it? Because for patients otherwise, so a patient with multiple comorbidities who, whose bloods may be different this week than they were a month ago I would take new bloods but um, stable patients that aren't very well tend not to have bloods because they tend not to present for anything that needs blood so uh, <laughs> you're almost in a bit of a catch-22 aren't you the more bloods you've got the more you think you might want to get another set um, I think that's up to the clinical judgment of the prescriber actually so I wouldn't put a number on that because it might be reasonable to accept bloods that are three months old from someone and it might be totally inappropriate to accept th bloods that are three months old from somebody else. So um, I don't think that is written into our protocol, probably for that reason, because look, we're not going to tell you, <laughs> you know, we're not going to tell you how to, to how, what you should do in this scenario. Be one, because you need to take responsibility for it, but two, because there are so many different scenarios. We couldn't possibly describe each one and then give you the right answer. Sorry, that's a bit woolly. No, but no, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we practice the same sort of um, approach as well in the anticoagulation clinic. You have to apply that clinical judgment, don't you? Um, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, Hugh, can I just ask you again, another question that comes up regularly is around um, administering low methylate heparin to patients in the community. You um, offer it to around a third of your patients and um, how do you manage with those needle phobic patients or patients unable to self-administer? 
Yeah, because it's all done pretty quickly because basically this, they kind of come in and the, they're given the injection, they're shown once and discharged. The majority of them seem to be okay or they have somebody with them that can do it. And as I say, we do occasionally have to switch to low-dose de DOAC, but it is, it is pretty unusual that we don't. Because certainly I don't think we have any involvement in, in kind of district nurses, partly because we know there isn't any, and <laughs> it's what's not there. So generally we don't really find it to be a huge problem. And our, our blood, we kind of look at about six months is our thing for the bloods we look at. But actually we, we wouldn't, we start often the prophylaxis before blood's about. We don't, we'll give the first dose, we don't, we don't wait for the first dose. And actually in ED, a lot of the time they'll have venous gases done, which tells you pretty much everything you need to know anyway. So that, that does make it more straightforward rather than even needing formal blood. Yeah, great. Thanks. It's amazing, actually, isn't it? How many people are able to self-administer low molecular weight heparin? You look at them and, and sometimes think, oh, I don't know if you'll manage. And um, and they're up for it and, and they cope very well, don't they? Fantastic. Um, well, that um, concludes our session today. Thank you so much for um, such a wonderful panel. I think you've done a great job at giving us such a nice oversight of, of these key issues in BT prevention. Um, thank you to the audience for, for attending and for all your fantastic questions. I'm so sorry that we didn't manage to get through them all. Um, really good questions, but please feel free to drop me in line. Um, I think most people seem to have my email address, or you can um, <laughs> you can catch me through the uh, BT Network website. Um, so once again, thank you to Joe and Thrombosis UK for hosting us, and happy World Thrombosis Day to everyone.